Find yourself a nail and some wire, and we're in business. Now, back in the old days, some of us used to, well, make our own toys. And one of the toys we would make was, well, we would take a nail, a large nail, and we would wrap a bunch of times around that nail a wire, making a coil, and then attach to that coil a battery, at some sort of a dry cell battery, in order to generate a current in that coil. Now, if you generate or if you take a wire and you run current through that wire, in the if you take the thumb of your right hand and you point it in the direction that current is flowing in that wire, your fingers are going to generate, are going to show you the direction in which a magnetic field is being generated in that wire. Now, by putting a coil, by making a coil, all of those little tiny electromagnetic fields that are generated around that wire are all built upon each other, and that building upon magnetizes this nail, and you get a strong magnetic field in this nail. Now, taking the fingers of your right hand and putting, so if I've got current flowing in this direction, out this direction, if I put the fingers of my right hand in the direction that current is flowing around that coil, my thumb is pointing in the direction that this magnetic field is created. So I've got a magnetic field that is coming out of the top of the nail. Problem is, is that just like electronics, electromagnetics like to have a complete circuit. So this electromagnetic field is going to flow all the way back around and come back into the bottom of the nail. Now, Electromagnetic fields much prefer flowing through an iron-based material than they do flowing through air. So what would make this even more efficient, make this magnet more efficient, so to speak, is to, well, what we could do is simply take this nail, and through the magic of my light board, I could take this nail and I could make a big loop with it. And in doing so, this electromagnetic field now wants to flow through this iron. All right. And so as long as current is flowing through that coil and it's generating an electromagnetic field, it's going to have an electromagnetic field flowing through that coil, all right, or through that core. All right. Now, if I put another coil on this side, and I don't have any power set up to that particular coil, then the electromagnetic field that is flowing through this is going to generate a little bit of current or voltage in this. It's going to do the exact opposite. Whenever you generate, an, whenever you pr provide an electromagnetic field around a coil, it then absorbs that in the form of moving its electrons back and forth. Now, this only works with AC voltage or AC current, alternating current, okay? In other words, remember in geometry you learned about that sine wave, right? Well, this sine wave is the, the current flowing in one direction and then in the other direction, in the one direction and in the other direction. And having that electromagnetic field then flowing back and forth will produce an alternating current of the same frequency in that coil. Now, what about the voltage though? Well, the voltage, the way the voltage works is that you've got a certain number of turns, a certain number of times you've wrapped that wire around the one, uh, the one piece of iron and the number of turns that you wrap the wire around this, this, this corresponding uh, core. And that ratio, called a turns ratio, will tell you the proportion or the ratio of the voltage from this side to this side. So let's say that for every two turns on this side, I have one turn on this side. That means that the voltage on this side is going to be twice that of the voltage on that side. Now you may not be familiar with the properties of power, but power is equal to voltage times current. 
All right. Now, whenever you are moving or when you're putting power into this coil, you're not going to be creating any additional power, nor are you going to be destroying any power. The power should, in an ideal world, be the same on both sides of this coil. So if I have half the voltage on the, this side than I have on this side, then my current, in order to make it so that the power stays the same, my current is going to be doubled on this side from what it is on this side. And so this gives you the ability to, to raise and lower voltages, to raise and lower current. Also, if you know anything about Ohm's law, it also gives you the ability to make it look like impedance or resistance is actually changing from one side to the other. Now, real quick before we go on to anything else, I want to give you a name for these different pieces. This side right here, this coil right here, the one that's getting or receiving the power is referred to as the primary coil. All right. This one that is absorbing the electromagnetic fields in order to have that generate the uh, generate voltage and current, that guy is called the secondary. All right. Now, this is a little hard to draw on some sort of a schematic or some sort of an electronic diagram. So there are much simpler ways to draw this or express this particular circuit. Let me make a little bit of room here to show you a couple of those symbols. So probably the simplest symbol to show or represent a transformer is to do a little kind of like the wire coming in. So here's one connection, here's another connection. And just these little yeah, half circles to represent the turns around the, uh, the core. And so this guy would be the primary. And then you also would have a similar circuit or a similar symbol to represent the secondary. And typically what you'll have is a couple of vertical lines in the middle to represent the iron core that exists between them. Now, whenever you're looking at something like a power supply that is in a computer, um, it turns out we're going to need a number of different levels. And so you may see something that looks like this, where you've got the primary on the one side, the iron core, and then you've got the secondary. But on the secondary side, you actually have these pieces that are kind of tapping off of different points in that coil. And what they're going to do is make different, allow you to touch off of different connections here to take different turns ratios from one side to the other. This is referred to as a tapped winding. In other words, we're tapping off of that coil at different spots in order to get different voltages. Now, I've already talked about one of the applications of a transformer, and that is the ability to step up or step down voltages. And so if you have, if you're creating some sort of a power supply or something where you need different voltage levels, sometimes you use a transformer in order to get those different levels. But it turns out that there are other things that are very important, other important uses of a transformer. For example, if I have a transformer that has a one to one turns ratio, well, that doesn't seem very nice. I mean, that doesn't seem very useful at all. I mean, all I'm doing is I'm taking one voltage and I'm creating the exact same voltage on the other side. Why don't I make just a direct connection? Well, what this does for us is it creates electrical or elec electrical isolation. Isolation. Let's see if we can spell correctly today. Electrical isolation. And this one-to-one -one transformer makes it so that the device that's on this side, it's expecting to have, for example, the voltage coming out of our wall sockets. So it's expecting to see that. But 
just in case something happens, some catastrophic event, a spike, something happens that could damage what's on this side, what we do is we put electronic isolation between it. And that makes it so that there is no actual physical connection between these two devices so that some sort of an event on this side will not damage the equipment on this side. A one-to-one -one transformer usually provides that isolation for us. But there are other applications for transformers, or at least the theory of transformers, that we will use with our electronics. For example, there is something called a resolver. Now, a resolver, its position is to deter, its position, its purpose is to determine rotational position. All right. How does a resolver determine rotational position? Well, what you do is you take one transformer, right? And this one is fixed, or excuse me, one coil. And so this guy is fixed. It doesn't move. It's stationary. And then you take another transformer, the, the one that's the, I did it again, another coil. And this one you put on some sort of a shaft that rotates. Now, the electrical fields that are being generated by the fixed one are passing through the rotating one. And if they're lined up, what you've got is something like this. And on the fixed side, we're just gonna have a sine wave, just generating a sine wave that's supposed to be captured by the one that's rotating. Now, if they are both lined up, then what you're gonna get is a sine wave, right? Now, as the one rotates, it actually is going to stop lining up with the fields, the electromagnetic fields that are being generated by the primary coil. And so as it rotates, its amplitude is going to get less and less and less until it gets to a point where it's down to zero. And what it means when it's down to zero is it means that they are 90 degrees offset from one another. Now, if you continue to turn, what's gonna happen is our frequency is gonna stay the same, but the amplitude is going to flip. It's going to go negative. And in fact, when we get to a point where the amplitude is back to the maximum amplitude, but it's 180 degrees out of phase, that means that the fixed coil is 180 degrees out of phase with the rotated coil. Gives you the ability to identify whether or not you've got, or it gives you the ability to determine the position of a rotating shaft. Another thing that transformer, the theory, gives us is RFID tags, specifically passive RFID. For those of you not familiar with the term RFID, we've got radio frequency identification. And you've got a transmitter or a reader, sometimes it's just simply called an RFID reader. And it is broadcasting out, guess what, electromagnetic waves. And whenever you're looking at the receiver side, the tag, so we've got on this side the RFID tag, its antenna, whenever it picks up on its antenna, when it picks up these electromagnetic waves, it goes into something referred to as a rectifier. And that rectifier generates voltage. So we don't have to have a battery or anything in that RFID tag. We just simply receive these electromagnetic waves, generate our own electricity, so that we can then send a pattern back that can be read by the RFID reader. So there you go. Transformer theory, it may not be necessary for you to build some sort of a power supply, but it turns out that the theory of how transformers work may be very applicable to you and your digital designs.